once Breen became the top man uh, for censorship in Hollywood, but, but he had no power at this point, what he tried to do was to amass power. And he did it by encouraging a boycott in Philadelphia of all movies and then encouraging the Catholic Legion of Decency to be formed, which it did in April of 1934. They started raiding films. And at that point, the studios got terrified because they thought, uh-oh, 20 million Catholics, who are all in the major cities for the most part, are going to stop going to the movies. Now, that didn't happen, really. The Catholics continued to go to the movies. And in fact, every time the Legion banned something, box office went up. But the studios weren't paying attention to that. They were paying attention to the threat. And then eventually, he was able to use the Legion of Decency as leverage when he dealt with Hayes, who was his boss. Will Hayes was his boss and say, hey, I am the only guy who can mediate between the studios and the Legion. Please, you know, give me the power. I will save you. I will save the studios. Give me all the power. I'll, just, I'll, I'll decide what movies get released and what l- movies don't get released. And at that point, he had, you know, he had all, he'd, he'd won the game. It was beautiful. The, the example of Breen, actually, is a really very good lesson for people in how a minority, can, a very organized minority, can uh, you know, obtain power. It's, uh, you know, there are people who are trying, you know, trying to do that today all, all the time. You know, the politically correct people on the left and the moral majority people on the right. Okay, now what I have in here, we've kind of covered the next one. Did the production code redefine the meaning of the happy ending? And can you contrast <laughs> the endings of Mary Stevens, M.D. with the okay. plan within? Okay, that's very important. Yeah, now I think Lena's currently cut out Mary Stevens, M.D. But, yeah, which uh, is, you can't, that, that's like, you can't cut that out. Yeah. No, that, so, obviously, no, no. Well, if, you, well, if, you, if you cut Mary, you, you can't, you can't you, it's like having a punchline without the, if you don't have the ending of Mary Stevens, M.D., the ending of Flame Within makes no sense. And the ending of Flame Within, is the thing that's going to make everybody say, oh, my God. Okay. Have you ever seen it? Tell us about those two. Have I haven't you? seen that one. Okay. No. Oh, wait, wait till you see it. You'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, the ending of Mary Stevens, M.D. Uh, Mary, Stevens, okay. Mary Stevens, M.D. is about a woman physician, and the ending of Mary Stevens, M.D. reaffirms K. Francis as Mary Stevens not only as a physician but as a woman and a physician. And then you cut to the clip. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. And then you come back. Okay, contrast the ending of Mary Stevens, M.D. to the ending of The Flame Within, which was made under the code. Anne Harding plays a woman who, who's a doctor, and she's going out with a man who doesn't, who's also a doctor but doesn't think that his wife should work. And so the ending of the movie, the supposedly happy ending of that film, is her turning her back on her entire life's work in order to marry this guy. Uh, then don't say that film. Say this film. This We're film. We're going to show it. Okay. Uh, okay. The ending of Mary Stevens. Okay. The ending of A Flame Within, made uh, under the code in 1935, is a com- you know completely contrasts. Well, no, what, what, how did I get into it? I, uh, Actually, you, getting into it that way is just fine. Okay. You okay. Don't need anything more. Okay. The ending of of. Uh, the ending of The Flame Within from 1935, made under the code, it, you know, is a complete uh, refutation of a woman as a professional. Anne Harding plays a doctor who is in love with another doctor, but this doctor insists that, uh, that Anne Harding give up her career as a psychiatrist. And the happy ending of the film, the ending that's supposedly happy, is her turning her back on her entire life. Now, when you see that footage, when you see the ending of that film, it's, it's fascinating because... Uh, Harding is playing a woman where she's saying, okay, I, you know, I'm going to marry you. And you'd think that should be a happy ending. And in fact, it seems that the people who made the movie thought it was a happy ending because the music is happy and they cut to this nice old guy who's smiling and patting his knee and he's happy. And the lines, the, the dialogue is happy. But Harding plays this like she's just had a lobotomy. She plays this as a moment of complete abject defeat and soul death. And it's as if this, isn't, this actress is trying to get a message, smuggle a message out of a totalian... T- too bad. I had it going. All you really need to do, though, is, um, if we're going to use it, is say that what she, you know, the way she yeah. plays it okay. tells that she feels very yeah. differently about yeah. it than okay. the movie. That's right. The way Harding plays this scene, despite the fact that the music and everybody else seems to think is a happy ending, she plays it as a moment of abject defeat and soul death. She plays it like she's just had a lobotomy. And it's as if she's trying to sneak out a message out of a totalitarian country. And I like to think that that message is for us, you know, all these decades later, to see what this very intelligent, 
very modern actress was trying to tell us about this ridiculous, demented ending that she was being subjected to. All right. Good. Okay, let's see. I'm going to do this batch here. Please give us your live version of the following statement. When the code hit, every actress got her virginity back, lost her edge, her ability to surprise, and consequently her social relevance. <laughs> okay. Uh, once the code came in, all the women in Hollywood got their virginity back, and if they lost it again, they were in big trouble. And uh, so they, you know, they, all of a sudden they became a lot less interesting than the women who were watching them on screen, and, so they, became, and they became a lot less interesting to the men. You know, the thing is, women's pictures under the pre-code were not women's pictures. They were movies. They were the movies. Those were the movies that everybody wanted to see. And the biggest stars of the era were the women. Uh, very soon later, women's pictures would be women's pictures, and they would be a kind of a ghettoized genre because they were no longer speaking to people about what was really going on in the world. They were presenting instead some kind of fairy tale version that anybody with any sophistication knew wasn't true. That's 